In this video I continue my almost certainly unsuccessful attempt to help Kent Hovind to understand basic science. I'm going to play a long clip of Hovind so to make it more bearable I increase the speed. Alright, okay Pastor Hovind, uh, this next question is also from Andrew, and Andrew's doing a great job at like uh, debating these atheists, but he gets questions from time to time that he passes along. And this next question, uh, Andrew stated to the atheist, uh, he asked for an example of a beneficial mutation, and he received the following response from the atheist. Well, you could use one of thousands of beneficial mutations, but there is one cool one, and that is the one that made the sperm uh, capable of swimming. So any response to that? Uh, anybody who believes that would need their head examined. <laughs> uh, that's like saying there's a mutation that makes the bird, make the birds capable of flying. You know how complicated <laughs> flight is and what's required for wings and the heartbeat and the oxygen carrying in the muscles and the, the frame of the bird. It's just like, hello, to make the sperm capable of swimming requires a protein-driven little tiny motor in the skin of the sperm that twists the tail. It's like an outboard motor. It is phenomenally complex. It didn't happen as a mutation. That guy needs his head examined if he believes that that is a result of a mutation, uh, which, by the way, all mutations observed have been neutral, fatal, or harmful. There's never been a beneficial one. He says there are thousands of beneficial mutations, and that's the best he can come up with. Well, A, there's no evidence at all that that is a result of a mutation. B, it is impossible for all those millions of things to line up just right to make that even happen. It is, that is way outside the field of science. This is, he's off in a fairy tale world to claim that it was a mutation that made the sperm capable of swimming. Well, how did they reproduce before it was capable of swimming? Mm hmm. Mm, that's right. <laughs> I've never heard such a stupid answer, and I'm sorry, I'm not sure call people stupid in that. I can't think of a more appropriate term for that one. That is stupid. No, that's not, uh, that's not a mutation at all. It's, a cre it's created that way. It's phenomenally complex. Uh, the uh, little tiny motor that spins like 100,000 RPM in some of these little uh, flagellated uh, bacteria that have these little tiny uh, motors in there. There's whole I guess, Institute for Creation Research, ICR, did a great article about that. Uh, these little tiny uh, motors that spin the hairs. Uh, they go propel them forward or backward. And how does it, how is it heat seeking? How does it seek out the ovum? I mean, that you're talking about such a complicated thing that'll blow your mind. It is a million times more complicated than launching a rocket from Earth and making it hit the moon. Yep. The sperm hitting the ovum is at least a million times more complicated than NASA launching a rocket to hit the moon. Mm. Dreaming if they think that happened by chance. Okay, next question. No, very good. And, you know, along those lines, Pastor Hogan, the first time I was introduced to the complexity of that, um, of that, you know, what you're talking about was, uh, Darwin's Black Box, a book written by Michael Behe. Have you heard of that book? I've read it four times, I love it. Okay, very good, yep, very good. All right, Pastor Hovind, uh, the next question also comes from Andrew. I can't be certain, but based on what Hovind said, he seems to be confusing the bacterial flagellum with the eukaryotic flagellum. Sperm swim using the eukaryotic flagellum, which is completely different from the bacterial flagellum, and they evolved independently of each other. They are no more similar than birds' wings and insect wings. I'm not going to go into the evolution of the bacterial flagellum because that has already been discussed many times and Concordance already made two excellent videos on the evolution of bacterial chemotaxis. In this video I'm going to discuss the evolution of the eukaryotic flagellum. The caller was mistaken in that the flagellum could not have been produced by a single mutation. Hovind cites Michael Behe who claims that the flagellum could not have evolved because it is irreducibly complex and so you cannot remove any of the parts without it losing its function. As I explained in my video Evolution of Blood Clotting, taking away a part and seeing if the system still works is a terrible way to test whether that system could have evolved. In the case of blood clotting, some proteins that are essential in humans are missing in other vertebrates. Let's do this experiment for the flagellum anyway. Let's take away some of its parts and see if it still works. As it happens nature has already done the experiment for us. The flagellum of the eel sperm is missing the central doublet, the central spokes and the dynein outer arms yet it is still functional. Flagella are built by a system known as intraflagellar transport. In Michael Behe's second book The Edge of Evolution in which he spends a lot of time talking about malaria he also claims that intraflagellar transport is irreducibly complex. In a section of his book titled Irreducible Complexity Squared he claims that intraflagellar transport is required to build the flagellum and both systems are irreducibly complex. So which system came first? 
Well it turns out that some organisms are missing intraflagellar transport entirely and are still capable of building a flagellum. One of those organisms is Plasmodium falciparum also known as the malaria parasite. The same parasite that Behe spends a lot of the book talking about. So is intraflagellar transport irreducibly complex? It turns out that many species are missing parts of the complex yet it is still functional. The intraflagellar transport complex is divided into three subcomplexes known as IFTA, IFTB and the BB sum. As this paper shows some species are missing the BB sum. One species is missing the BB sum and IFTA as well as some proteins in IFTB. This clearly shows that intraflagellar transport is not irreducibly complex. I would advise Mr. Hoven to be more careful about where he gets his information from in the future.